Hey, what up, what up, what up, what up? Welcome to another episode of Biologizing. I'm out here in the giant Sequoia National Monument area of Southern California, just kind of walking, perusing through through the forest here. And uh, I'm trying to make this quick because I, I got stuff to do, but uh, stumbled upon this stream here and the stream looks pretty interesting. A lot of stuff to talk about, so uh, let me go ahead and talk about it. Okay, so if you notice already, this is a running stream. It's springtime here in Southern California. So you got a lot of the, the running off of the snow melt coming down these streams and these mountains and eventually collecting in the bigger river bodies. But uh, looking at this part right here, you can see the sediment here, it's, it's pretty sandy. So this is kind of indicative of a, of a recent major flooding event. I mean, I don't know how recent, maybe, maybe within the last year or so, but a bunch, of, a bunch of rain came down and deposited all these kind of fine grain sediments all along this stream bed here so you could tell that anything underneath this sediment had had got covered up there's probably stuff like like those boulders and and maybe other large cobble or something like that underneath all this but when the last rainfall event that major rainfall event came through it covered all this up and that has certain consequences and one of those consequences is that that cobble that might have been under here now that it's covered up oh shit. Not gonna lie, that scared the shit out of me. All right, anyway, so now that the sediment has covered up uh, the original bottom, which probably looked like, like that cobble and those boulders right there, uh, you basically lose a lot of surface area. So you lose the nooks and crannies that you would get in those cobbles and stuff. So um, to be honest, searching for stuff in here uh, might not be that productive. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not anything living in this stuff. It's just like, it might be too small. They probably, it's probably organisms small enough to kind of live in between cracks and crevices of fine sand grain or gravel grains and stuff like that. But yeah, this water transported sediment also might provide a new open resources for uh, other living things such as plants. I mean, you got these examples right here. You got a, you got this young alder. I think it's an alder. Yeah, it looks like an alder genus alnus yeah i don't know if this was like a seed or anything like that uh, i'm thinking that it's possibly uh, an offshoot of this bigger alder right here this bigger tree right here this is also an alder so it might be possible that this little one kind of shot up from the root system of that larger one and then you also got this right here this is a famous plant this is urtica dioica otherwise known as the stinging nettle if you touch it it stings you because it has those it's got those urticating hairs see right there so uh, that's an uh, evolutionary adaptation to herbivory, to anything that tries to eat this while those spines are nice and fresh. Uh, yeah, they get stung. Yeah, I think it's got formic acid or, or some sort of acidic compound inside the tissues of this, of this organism right here. Yeah, so if uh, you know a large mammal tries to eat it, uh, it gets stung. And uh, it's painful and it lasts a few hours too. But you know, I guess this, pl this plant's found like in a lot of places, not just North America, it's also found in Europe. And I think like old school Europeans, they used to collect this and boil it down. Cause I guess when you boil it down, those urticating hairs, they diminish. And uh, it's very nutritional, about as nutritional as spinach. Or I think it might even be more nutritional than spinach. This, this is another one of those plants that I kind of don't care. Like you can harvest it, whatever, go ahead and harvest it. It's everywhere. It, it even grows in like cities and towns and people's backyards and stuff like that. So you, I mean, you know, you can harvest it from other people's backyards. You don't need to come out here and harvest it. So yeah, these are just a couple of plants, a couple of the, the first recruits to an area that's been covered by uh, flood transported sediment. But uh, let's go look at some other stuff that's not covered in sediment. All right, coming downstream a little bit, you can see right here, this collection of uh, cobble and small boulders that is, uh, it looks like it's being uh, sheared away of, its, of, of the sediment that covered it during that last major rainfall event. And uh, you can see like, just because it's a bunch of cobbles and small boulders that there's much more uh, surface area for things to live in. And not to mention also that, you know, the water running through and getting, getting pushed around through these cobbles, uh, it becomes highly oxygenated. So, so it makes a good home for a lot of animals to live in. And by animals, I mean stream insects. All right, let's check them out. Mm. Oh, okay, so th look what we got right here. All right, so this this is an insect in the genus Cephenis, Coleoptera, the beetle order, 
order a beetle. So yeah, this is a beet. It is a beetle, but it's not in its in its adult beetle form. Beetles have larvae, which then they pupate and then become the classic beetle that that we all know. But this one right here, this is in the genus Cephenis. Common name is uh, water pennies, and uh, their larvae have evolved a morphology that allows them to to kind of be like a limpet, you know, like those mollusks. But uh, except in marine environments, they're, they're out here in these freshwater stream environments. And they act as grazers. You know, they'll be grazing the algae. You can see right there, that little white patch or that light patch right there. Like, that's probably its grazing area that it was grazing on that algae. Yeah, genus Cephenis, Coleoptera. Pick up another rock. More Cephenis. Oh, look what we got right here. All right, so that looks like Blephocera. I think, or well, it's in the family Blephoceridae. Uh, I don't know the common name of, of, of what Blephocerids are, but it's a fly maggot that lives in these freshwater streams. Apparently, uh, if you see these, it's a pretty good sign that the water quality is doing pretty decent. They got these little suction cups on the ventral surface of their body that allows them to stick to the rocks. And I think these guys are grazers too. Grazing on algae and other detritus found in this freshwater stream. Yeah, Blephoceridae, order Diptera, order of true flies. All uh, right, right here we got some, uh, these are just some cases, some cases of uh, Trichopterans, order Trichoptera, Caddisfly order, sister order to the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths. Oh, there we go, there we go. Oh, so now, all right. So that's, that looks like Hydropsyche. Uh, Hydropsychidae, family Hydropsychidae. I don't know the common name of that family. But yeah, Trichopter, it looks like Hydropsyche, Hydropsychidae. I don't know, I'd have to pull it out and put it under a microscope to really tell the difference. He's just sitting there wondering, like, what's going on with my house right now, man? Oh, he's trying to bail. It's got a uh, sclerotized pronotum and metanotum. It's got those little hooks right there on its anal portion. Those uh, ventral gills on the ventral side of the abdomen. Yeah, Hydropsychidae, order Trichoptera, Caddisfly order. Just one of the many insects that can be found here. Let's keep going. All right, so move downstream a little bit, come to this little small, like a kind of like a cascade right here. Same idea as up there in those riffles. It's just like it's a cascade, so it's falling water. But same idea, it's getting oxygenated. So there's probably a lot of oxygen right here in this spot, which means, you know, Animals which breathe oxygen will probably be living in here. So let's go check it out. Oh. More trichoptera cases. I don't know. This might, this looks like it might be different. See how it's got like larger grain particles? This might be a different uh different it's definitely a different species of trichopteran. I, I don't know, I'm guessing Uinoide. But uh, I could be wrong. I think those are called like the tortoise shell tricot. Yeah, so this is kind of like tide pooling if you ever went tide pooling before, but instead of a marine environment, you know, it's a freshwater stream. But it's the same same style. Ooh, what is that? Oh, that's not that. Yeah, same style of same style of biologizing. You know, you pick up rocks, look underneath them because things live under rocks. You live under a rock. All right, so I don't know if you can see that, but like way down in there, looks like it might be an ephemeroptera or, no, nah, that looks like a plecoptera and that thing is really small. It's small. Oh, there go. that might be an ephemeroptera right there below it. I'm gonna have to zoom in crazy to this one. Yeah, mayflies and stoneflies. Kind of evolutionary convergence to each other as far as, you know, having that morphology of rock crawling insects. Some of them can be predators, especially the pleacops. Oh, there, there we go. They're starting to move now. So that one, yeah, that one right there looks like a, like it might be in the genus Betis family, Betidae. That light colored one, that's definitely a plecoptera and a stonefly, order plecoptera. Oh, what's it doing? I thought I was about to eat that one. Huh? No way. So you can see the morphology and what they're doing. You know, their behavior, how they're crawling along this rock. How the, you know, the behavior is evolutionarily convergent. 
But uh, I don't know, those plea cops, many of them are predators. Pretty aggressive predators too. A lot of the mayflies can be uh, predators also, but they also have grazers within that group too. And what is that right there? I can't, that might be a Chironomid, a Midge family Chironomid order dipper. At least that's my guess. I know these are small, but you know, it's, it's early in the spring. We still got a lot more year to go. Even though all that stuff is covered up with sediment, you know, all this water running through it will carry it down further, further downstream, down river. And uh, gradually, more and more surface area within these cobbles and boulders will be exposed, uh, basically increasing the, the real estate for the insects to, to basically habitate and, and perform their ecological duties. Okay, so there we go. Just a, just a quick couple of minutes kind of discussing, uh, you know, some of the organisms you can find in these freshwater streams. So yeah, just as a recap, we went up there. We had this tree bottom that was just covered up with this fine sediment laid down from the last floods. Moved a little bit downstream where the slope gets a little bit steeper and it starts to cut away all that sediment. And now you got this nice crenulated surface of stream bottom with a lot of surface area. Over here in this riffle section, highly oxygenated stuff Coarse particulate organic matter, AKA uh, small broken leaves and twigs are gonna get caught up in here. And then you have grazers and, and shredders that will shred that up. And then you have predators that will feed on those grazers and shredders. And uh, yeah, that's the ecology of this, this whole system right here. And all, all that sea palm, all that coarse particulate organic matter, like such as that right there is all falling in from these trees right here. So you can see that, you know, this stream area right here is just basically one giant gutter where things kind of fall in. And then living within the cracks and crenulations of the surfaces of the stream bottom, you have all these animals, particularly insects that have adapted uh, to use those resources and basically create a community here. But yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about. So uh, I'm gonna get out of here. Remember, keep your decision scientific, stay away from all the gimmicks. Peace up, peace out, learn something.